Well, thank you, Paul, and good morning all. So Paul is speaking to you today about the broader issues for the whole of the hydrogen economy, but I would like to focus on the challenges of scale and the specific challenges for engineers. Believe me, I wish that I was here today, but I can't be. And the reason is that the World Engineers Convention is in Melbourne, but today I have to be in Perth. And the reason I have to be in Perth is that I am presenting a once in a lifetime opportunity for me to the energy ministers from around Australia. I have been charged to lead the development of a national hydrogen strategy. And today is the day that the energy ministers chose to meet as I said, in Perth, 2,700 kilometres away. I can't break the laws of physics. I can't be in both places at the same time. So I'm privileged to be presenting to you by video today. Now, the transition to a hydrogen economy is difficult. So you've got to ask the question, why do we bother? Well, here's why. Let's look at where the majority of global greenhouse emissions come from. And you know what? They come from the energy sector. Over 70% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from energy. So it's the sweet spot. It's where we should be investing our effort for maximum return on investment. The goal is much higher than just building a hydrogen economy. The goal is to ensure that planet Earth continues to be a beautiful planet for us to occupy. Well, how do we do that? I propose to you that we do that by creating what I call an electric planet, where all of our primary energy, all of it, comes from clean electricity. But the scale of the transition, it's massive. The reality is there's plenty of clean energy. There's no limit to the amount of solar and wind energy that we can tap and convert into electricity. But it's not always convenient as electrons. Most of the time it is, but not always. Sometimes we need a high density transportable fuel. We need molecules. And we need that fuel with no carbon dioxide emissions. So what could it be? You can probably guess what my answer will be. Of course, it's hydrogen. Hydrogen, and I'd put it to you that hydrogen can represent about 15% of the end user demand. Where does it come from? There's no free hydrogen available on Earth. You can't just go and drill a hole to find hydrogen in the way that you would drill a hole to find natural gas. So we have to produce it. And the way that most of us are excited about is to produce it renewably from the combination of solar, wind and water taken into an electrolyzer or an electrolysis unit. And what do you get out? You get hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen Mostly you just let it go into the atmosphere. Not a problem at all. The hydrogen, that's the product you want. So you bottle the hydrogen. You bottle it and then send it down pipes to where you need it, put it into trucks to where you need it, compress it, liquefy it and send it to other countries. The challenge is to make it economically in really large volumes. We're not talking about doing a beaker in a lab class every second, we're talking about doing swimming pools of water every second. So it's a big challenge for engineers, but it's the sort of challenge that you love. It's also, I must admit, a challenge for financiers, investors and governments, but today we're talking about the opportunity for engineers and the difference that we can make. So again, I'd like you to imagine a world, a future, and in this particular pathway, I want to consider a future where Australia produces hydrogen equivalent in energy terms to Australia's 2018 LNG exports, liquefied natural gas. And Australia, by the way, vies with Qatar month by month to have the crown to be the largest exporter of LNG in the world. So we're talking about a non-trivial amount of LNG. We export per annum 70 million tonnes, 70 megatonnes of LNG, because hydrogen on a specific energy basis is 2.4 times denser than LNG, that 70 megatonnes of LNG would require us to export 30 megatonnes of hydrogen. And to make that from solar sources, we would need 2,000 terawatt hours. Now, not everybody in the audience will instantly grasp the enormity of 2,000 terawatt hours. Another way of looking at it is that is eight times the total annual production of electricity in Australia. 
we would need to build about 900 gigawatts of solar to make the hydrogen to produce for export at the same level as we currently do on LNG. In terms of land, it would be about 18,000 square kilometres. How do you think about 18,000 square kilometres? Well, it's about three quarters of the Anna Creek Station, the largest cattle station in Australia. It is substantially less than 1% of Australia's area. Let's keep imagining. Imagine a world where globally 15% of the end user demand is satisfied by hydrogen as the energy carrier. Now we're talking about 40,000 terawatt hours of electricity to produce that hydrogen. Again, to scale that in your mind or to imagine it, it's about 10 times the annual electricity production of America. You'd need to build about 18,000 gigawatts of solar, and yes, you'd have to occupy a few cattle farms. All of this adds up to opportunity for engineers, but it's only an opportunity if we seize it. Imagine a world in 2050 where the trade in hydrogen is in US dollars $1.3 trillion per annum. It's a big number. That is the number calculated from a bottoms up analysis by the Hydrogen Council. Just the hydrogen being traded per annum. What contribution can R&D make to improve the economics of that? Well, let's imagine that over the next 30 years through concerted effort in thousands of labs, the efficiency of electrolysis is increased by 10%, say from 60% to 70%. That would save $130 billion every year. Let's imagine if the fuel cell efficiency was increased to 50 to 60%, and further keep in mind that fuel cells will probably be responsible for delivering the value out of about half of that hydrogen, then that would save $65 billion per year. So my point is that whereas in a typical project, uh, an efficiency improvement of half a percent or 1% would probably not warrant your effort, cumulatively the effort of hundreds, thousands of engineers and scientists around the world to achieve a 10% increase in efficiency will pay back in spades. What are the other areas of research that we should be looking at? Let me just give you a few examples. One of the big challenges for Australia is shipping. And of course you can ship by liquefying their hydrogen, but the other very attractive way of shipping hydrogen is by chemically converting it to ammonia, NH3. There's a high density of hydrogen atoms per litre of ammonia. The challenge is at the other end, you can catalytically separate the ammonia into nitrogen and hydrogen, but then you've got to separate the hydrogen out of that mix. The CSIRO here in Australia has been developing what I think of as a reverse osmosis technology based on vanadium and palladium membranes to enhance that hydrogen recovery. Over in Georgia Tech in the United States, they're looking at the cost of the catalyst in fuel cells. Nearly all fuel cells use platinum as the catalyst and it's expensive. So what they're trying to do there is make a thin layer. They're starting with a monolayer of carbon, graphene, and putting two atomic layers of platinum onto that. Of course, the gases only see the surface, so two atomic layers is sufficient. And that will dramatically reduce the quantity of expensive platinum in the fuel cells. The, probably the most exciting opportunity is in steel making. Currently, steel making is responsible for 9%, 9% of all the carbon dioxide emissions planet wide. And as the rest of the economy improves over the next 10, 20, 30 years, if we don't do something about steel making, that 9% will become a much higher percentage of the global emissions. Well, without me going through the details, uh, work being done in Austria and Germany, uh, will allow the carbon, the, the metallurgical coal, the coking coal that is being used in the blast furnaces of the world to make steel to be replaced by hydrogen. Hydrogen for heating the iron ore and also hydrogen as a chemical for reducing the iron oxide into elemental iron. Hydrogen, it's here already. Look at that, a Class A truck driving in the streets of America trains travelling back and forth for regular public transportation in Germany. 
buses ploughing the streets in Korea. And of course in Japan, hydrogen cars are already in routine use. So there I am in Japan filling a Honda Clarity. Imagine the electric planet where instead of using oil, coal and gas to produce our electricity, we've taken them out of the equation, we've replaced them with solar and wind as our fundamental sources of primary energy. We massively increase the amount of electricity that we use so that we can use it in non-traditional sectors such as transportation, heating and industry. For those cases where electrons are insufficient, we'll use some of that electricity to make hydrogen and by doing all of that, we will have a world that is still magnificent. Wish me luck today, right now, in the presentation of Australia's National Hydrogen Strategy to the Energy Ministers of Australia. Enjoy the conference. Back to you, Paul. <laughs>